Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk about transitioning mechanisms. I'm uh, just before we start. How many of you have IPv6 in their network already? Wow. Okay. That's good. That's good. Impressive. Um, how many of you have tried one of the transitioning mechanisms? How many of you have a hurricane electric tunnel? Yeah, so you tried one. <laughs> OK, so um, basic, uh, basic disclaimer before we start. I work at the RIPE NCC. I'm a trainer. But although you can see from the slides that the, there's the NCC logo, this is not really official from the NCC because uh, we just we just give you, generally in our courses, an introduction on the mechanisms. We don't go into detail about that. So I decided at one point that it would, be, would have been good to be able to uh, go a little deeper in that. I got permission to come here and talk about this and use these slides. But uh, what I'm going to say, it's not really uh, completely official from the NCC. How many of you know what the NCC does? Ripe NCC. Only two. How many of you know how, what Erin does? A lot less. <laughs> I know, I know. In fact, they don't have a training department. Um, they don't do RIPE meetings. They don't, well, they don't do meetings as much as we do. There was the RIPE meeting this week with uh, about 500 people, uh, operators, um, content providers, and everything. Whoops. Um, so, well, you know what's happening in, uh, in, uh, in, in IPv4. Uh, Ayana, which stands on top of the of Erin, Ripe, Apinic, and all of them, they ran out of addresses in 2011. There was a nice ceremony. Of course, they decided to do it in Miami, because you don't do that in in Alaska. We got a nice uh, the Ripe NCC got a nice um, gadget, uh, 185/8 to bring home. So there's a, ser there's a picture of the ceremony with all the RIRs. Everybody got his own last <coughs> slash eight. And at that point, runout started. So first was APNIC. APNIC, Asia Pacific. They, they started allocating from the last slash eight. Then 2012 in September, we started allocating from the last slash eight. And who do you think is coming next? We still have three. Erin. Well, before Erin, actually, Lacknick and April this year, Erin, uh, only recently. The problem about Erin and uh, Lacknick is that they don't have policies specific for, uh, for dealing with the last slash eight. So, so far, the only one with more than a slash eight available is Afrinic. So there are a lot of companies popping up in Africa now to, to get address space there. The only problem is that you have to announce it from that region. But how is this going to evolve? Policies are in place. In, for example, in the ripe region in Europe, uh, you can only get, if you're an operator and if you're a newcomer, you can only get a slash 22. That's it, no more, no less. You get 1,000 IP addresses, independently of you being Deutsche Telekom with 100 million subscribers or the last provider that just popped up, you get 1,000 addresses. So there's not much space. And there is a policy, actually, in Aaronland that says there are, there's some space that's put apart for uh, dealing with the late newcomers for transitioning. But from out of that space, you will only be able to get small chunks, like a slash 28, a slash 29, slash 25. And as you might know, these are not routable on the internet because people filter them out. People filter down to the slash 24. So what can you do at this point if you, have, if you need more space? You can do transfers. So you... Sorry. Room. Uh, okay. Since we're double recording this, apparently. Okay. Room under hip. <laughs> I feel important. Woo, with two microphones. Very important. We are connected object now. 
Uh, well, you, we already are connected objects all the time. OK. So uh, you can transfer address space, especially if you live in this region. You can transfer address space also from Asian Pacific. But this is a costly operation. How many of you know the basic cost, the average cost of, uh, whoa, of an IPv4 address right now if you want to transfer it? It's around 10 euros, 10 to 12, 10 to 12 euros per address. So it's a costly operation. And what you're doing at that point is just delaying the change. So what you is just putting this off for later, still involving using money. Uh, one second, let me fix this. One on top of the other, do they? OK. So <laughs> the clip doesn't work here. Ah, uh, yeah, the clip is broken. Uh, OK, I'll just keep it in mind. Can do this, sort of. So uh, you're, we're just delaying the change. We're just postponing it. Well, we've been doing this for years. Uh, trying to come up with policies to show the need for addresses and um, coming up with smaller and smaller time frames for which the RIRs would hand out addresses and so on. But this is just delaying the change uh, too much for some time. So why, why do we want to get into, into IPv6? Well, you all know these numbers. but. Let me ask you a question. How many, how many of you have a smartphone here? How many of you have two? How many have three? Well, no, I don't have three, but uh, we get some, in some courses, we get people at the fourth, like, how many of you have four? Yes, I said, they're still showing up their hands. I still have, I have four smartphones. We have, we have getting to the Internet of Things. Uh, you know, we have heard of projects. There's the German government. They want to put sensors on the trash bins so that trucks don't pass by a trash bin if, they, if it's not full. Or Porsche has uh, sensors already on the cars. So if the car is going to, to be broken, you just get a notification. Uh, just go to the repair center because the car is going to break in 15 minutes. Or the, the German... Sorry? <laughs> The, well, or the, the German uh, railway system is uh, producing now trains that need 32 addresses per seat. And they have 400 seats on average for every, for every train. And they have to be unique in, in the whole system. Yeah, 32 addresses per seat for the comfort services, for the, for the video, for the climate, for all the different uh, systems you can have per seat. So imagine this is going to need lots and lots and lots of addresses. And we have to find a way to fit this in, in the space we have. So, oh. We have, though, in V6, how many of you know about the multiple addresses and the different kinds in, in V6? So basically, what we're going to use is global unicast. But we have some parts that are already reserved. We just point out three here in this scheme. 624, Torido, NAT64 for the transitioning mechanisms. So basically, these are, these, uh, these are parts of address space that for now are reserved for being used for those. And there are also, well, unique local, just let me give you an introduction about it, is meant for hosts that are not going to be connected to the internet. It's like private address space, but since there's no NAT, this is only for, address, for hosts that are not going to be routed through the internet. And link local, if you have a laptop in front of you with any flavor of Unix, you, just, you will just have one of that on any interface you have if you enable v6. So we will concentrate mostly on these three during the talk. So what are we trying to solve with transitioning mechanisms? As I said, APNIC was the first, um, first RIR to run out of addresses. So in the region, there are already some islands where some people are only implementing v6 in their networks because they can't get addresses. So what we have to do is find a way 
to provide our users or uh, provide uh, the users of our users of our customers to access those uh, sites, to access those services, while keeping the address the the actual address space running. Uh, how can we do that? We can do it. Oh, sorry. We can do it with tunneling or translating addresses. So let's see the first one. Six and four. First mechanism. Tunnel brokers, Hurricane Electric, Six Access. We all know about them. And I saw that a lot of you already uh, used it and implemented it. So it's stable and predictable, sort of. But uh, if you have a huge residential market or if you have different networks, if you have many hosts to, to manage, it's not practically feasible because you would have to set it up manually on all, each and every one of those hosts. So, but it works by encapsulating v6 into v4. So you would have IPv4 host that talks over an IPv4 only infrastructure. You get to a tunnel server run by a tunnel broker and you get on the IPv6 internet. So your packet gets, your IPv6 packet gets encapsulated into v4 here, goes over the internet, gets decapsulated here and goes v6 and comes back still through the tunnel server. This works. Um, a lot of people use it every day, but it's not scalable and doesn't provide, uh, doesn't provide, well, provides problems with the MTU, but um, it's static. So there's a second way of using tunnels that's six to four. Six to four is exactly the same concept, but the address space that we use for establishing the tunnels is any casted there's a special part of the address space in v4 and v6 destined to uh, 6 to 4. That's any casted to the internet. So basically your CPE or your, um, your host brings up a tunnel to one of the tunnel servers operated by somebody on the internet. Uh, we like to say it could be the NSA wanting to intercept your traffic. But anybody could run a, uh, anybody who can speak BGP in their network could run one of the uh, 6 to 4 tunnel servers. What is the problem here though? I send out a packet, it gets encapsulated here, gets out from the anycast, uh, anycasted tunnel server that's closest to me, gets on the internet, the IPv6, and now here we have a host somewhere. But the host at one point will send back an answer that gets actually to the closest anycasted um, tunnel server to him, to the host. So we have asymmetric routing most of the time using this mechanism, which is not really what we want because we cannot really control what the flow is going to be. So for this reason, in France, uh, a guy called Remy Depré created a uh, transitioning mechanism. He invented it and free in France was the first provider to use it. Guess how this mechanism is called? 6RD from Remy Depré. And then later it was changed into rapid deployment. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, the concept is still the same, exactly the same. So we have a tunnel server, but in this case, this is run by, uh, by the provider providing the service. So what we have is an um, a um, hard-coded address into the CPE. So we use the public IPv4 address on the CPE. The CPE establishes a tunnel to the tunnel server here. And what they get is a, uh, a slash 64, so a small address space, that gets delivered here over the tunnel. So the home user gets a slash 64, the first uh, 32 bits are generally uh, provider space. The second 32 bits are the actual, the IPv6 encoded IPv4 address, public IPv4 address that the user has here. Yes, we have a question. It's actually now uh, slash 16. Shift in, in free, from, from free. Okay, well, that's an implementation they had. But in general, that's, um, that's the, you get a slash 64. But say uh, because they have, I didn't check, but they have. For that, you need a larger address space, actually, because they need you need then a slash 
28 to do that. Sorry, I don't want to be able to use that. Yeah. It, it happened some months after the first implementation. Okay. So do you have it at home? Yes. Can you watch YouTube? Uh, <laughs> I know about this. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what you, what you get then at home is um, sort of native v6 on your local network. It gets encapsulated and gets out of the 6RD tunnel server. The difference between this and using uh, 6 to 4 is that, of course, it's all managed by your provider and you're using space from your provider, which makes it more usable in a, in a, in a business environment because you can control everything and you can ask them to, um, you can ask your provider to, to check everything and you have the same level of service generally that, that you have on, uh, on a normal dual stack network. Yes? Uh, does the provider need to assign public IPv4 yes. to the end user? Well, not really. Inside your network you could still use private uh, address space because what you have to do is actually establish the uh, tunnel to the um, to the, to the CPE here. But um, yeah, what is generally used is uh, your public IP address that's put, it in, put into, the, into the, uh, the space there. This is the mechanism that was used by Free initially and was used uh, uh, about a year ago from Swisscom and now Belnet and Belgacom. In Switzerland, Swisscom pushed a button, implemented uh, 6RD from one day to the other, and they put 800,000 uh, users directly on v6 from one day to the other, jumping from nothing percent uh, IPv6 usage in the country to 10 something percent. And Bel Belgium is now leading with 14 percent, 12, 14 percent of users using the same uh, transitioning mechanism because. What you can do with 6RD is you just, you just need a CPE that runs it and then everything in, in the infrastructure you don't have to touch. You don't have to touch anything else. Question? It's not exactly the same level of service because... Well, it gets encapsulated, I know. No, the thing is you can get the slash 48 from 6 or hc.net and you can have your own reverse. Yeah. Which does provide mm -hmm. it V4 but not well, V6. Well, if they don't provide the reverse, well, they could provide the reverse because... Yes, and yeah, exactly. Not the same exact level of service, I'm sorry, but because here you get the slash 64, but I mean in terms of using v6, you get the slash 64 or 60, well you get 16 slash 64s. Um, that's true, you could get a larger address space, but, uh, but this is, if you were to get a larger address space, then they would have to, uh, well you could still do that, you could still route that through, through the tunnel. Yes, it depends on how the provider does it. But in this case, yes. But what I meant is that basically everything is controlled by, by the provider, so you can expect to have some check on the quality of service they're providing. Um, what I wanted to say here was, um, there is something else. Well, so basically this is what's, what's being used most of the time from the European providers to provide v6 natively. Now, what you have here, though, is the home user in this case will get IPv6 without noticing. You know, there's a mechanism actually, it's called happy eyeballs, to make sure that uh, the system is going to use either v6 or v4, preferring v6 if it works. If it doesn't work, it will just fall back to v4. So, Basically, the users are not going to notice it that much, that there's v6 enabled. Uh, I have a few friends in Switzerland, which are on Swisscom, and they didn't realize they were using v6 until I told them. So, it kind of works. Then, we switch out, we switch over paradigm. We've seen uh, an IPv4 only infrastructure. But NAT64, in this case, is uh, completely opposite. We have an IPv6-only infrastructure, so we change completely. In this case, what we have is the home user only gets IPv6 and doesn't get IPv4. And the way it works is by having a translation box and then a, a DNS box that does some, some mangling with the DNS answers. But what happens is home user tries to reach a website they get through, they put up a DNS request, the DNS 
goes either v6 or v4 over the internet, queries the uh, DNS. If it gets a response that contains a v6 address, a uh, quad A record, it will just send it back to the user. The user goes natively on v6. Nothing happens. Everything's fine. But if the answer from DNS contains only v4 records, we have a problem here because the network here is v6 only. And we still want to reach it. So what the DNS 6.4 will do is translate, take that uh, v4 answer and put it into a specific v6 prefix that's a slash 96, so we still have 32 bits, uh, and IPv6 address is 128 bits. So we'll, put, we'll embed these, uh, that IPv4 address into a v6 address and send it as an answer to the home user, which at that point will use that as destination for his outgoing packets, which will go through the NAT64 box. They will get translated, go over the v4 internet, and when they come back, they hit, hit it again, and they get translated again with the uh, native v6 uh, address with the IPv4 uh, address embedded. Uh, this requires having both the DNS64 and NAT64 boxes running uh, all together. And the problem we have here, what can you, what can you imagine? DNSSEC. DNSSEC is broken, of course. Well, actually, no. There is an RFC showing you how you could do, uh, you could do um, NAT64 and DNS64 with a specific daemon over the home user's computer that still does DNSSEC. Um, yes, it's a little complicated, so you don't want to do it for your end users, but DNSSEC is going to be broken because you have something in the middle that rewrites your queries and and, and, and. Do you know of any service that doesn't work on v6? How many of you use Skype or Twitter? Well, you were going to say that. I don't use it, but... But you know, you know that, that those are broken. So if you have a home user that wants to use Skype, it will not work. So there is there's going to be, well, there is, there is a patch on top of on top of this, it's called 464 exlat. We add another patch on top of the transitioning mechanism where we actually, the scheme is a little bit um, forviant, we say. So basically, the mobile user, this is the case for, we highlight a mobile user because NAT64 is implemented on some uh, uh, mobile networks here in the in the US, like Sprint and Verizon. We're not in the US. Sorry? Sorry, we're not in the not US. In, in this US. continent, on this the continent, Canadian sorry. Providers are way dumber. Sorry? The Canadian providers are way dumber. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you expect them to do at this point? Um, die. Go until they go out and fall over and die. <laughs> Carry a brave nap. Because they don't understand BGP. Yes. Hmm. Well, you don't need you don't need BGP to run to run NAT64. Well, whatever. So, okay, okay, okay. So basically, what you do at this point is have a um, have a mobile user or a user that runs a small daemon that creates a local network that's v4. V4 gets translated by this little daemon into V6, sent over to the NAT64 box, and then again on the V4 internet. So basically you add a layer of translation again. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> it's already on, uh, it works out of the box on the recent versions of Android, and there's a daemon as well, we'll see that in a moment, that works on, um, uh, works on uh, Linux and Unix uh, variants. So yes, uh, this is how things are at the moment. If you need to access v4 content on a mobile network where you, where you just have v6 and NAT64. And DSLite is the last one. DSLite is similar to uh, 6RD, but what we have is a V6 infrastructure, and we tunnel um, 
we tunnel V4, because we have a private network here, we tunnel it over here and we NAT44 on the box. There are two variants of DS Lite. One is the main DS Lite and, then is, and one is MAP, A plus P, where actually instead of just NATing here, you reserve a small chunk of ports for every single user. So users share uh, just port numbers for a single IP address and they're only going to use a small, a reduced number of them on the NAT box there. So this is an idea of how transitioning mechanisms work. Uh, there's, there are actually many, many more because the idea people have here is, oh, those are, that idea is broken and there are so many, I don't want to choose one of them, so I'll create my own. And then we end up with N transitioning mechanisms plus one. So the last time I tried to count them, I stopped at 37 or something, uh, RFCs. So this is just a little collection of the most frequently used and seen ones on the, uh, today on uh, the internet. So now let's see, six in four on BSD. It's just a tunnel, we spoke about it. So if you go to Hurricane Electric um, 6 Access, they'll just give you copy and paste instructions to just go and create it. That's pretty easy, neat. Most of the time, uh, Hurricane Electric will give you a slash 48 out of the box, and then you end up with a problem about subnetting, but this, that's not part of this, uh, of this talk. Uh, six access, you have to go through different steps and uh, you have to certify to get a uh, bigger address space. So you start with the slash 64 and if you want more, you have to go through a process to get more space. But let's take a look at 6 to 4. 6 to 4, same as in uh, 6 in 4, but tunnels should be dynamically created. So for example, in FreeBSD, you just have to add this to your, to your rc.conf you just add what uh, an, you create, you, you set up a network interface, um, in this case USB Ethernet 0, and you set up a default router. This is actually the broadcast address uh, that's inside the, um, the uh, 6RD defined address space. So basically you use that as your, um, as your gateway, and you tell the STF interface, doesn't mean what you're thinking about, STF interface, you set up the, uh, your, out, um, your one interface's IP address here so that the system can establish tunnels. So what the system is going to do at that point is try to, try to connect to the closest 6RD um, tunnel server and try to establish a tunnel to send out your packets from. And then what you can do is um, uh, at that point use the, uh, configure the local interfaces, but we'll see that uh, later. Has anybody ever tried this? Yes? A long, long time ago. Okay. Did it work? As well, I tried it recently and it, it works. Okay, question. Well, yes. Uh, you, have, um, you have a slash uh, 16 and you can use the address space from, uh, from 6 and 4 to or you can use your own address space behind it and route it through 6 and 4 to get out, to get out of that. The ISP I use has uh, slash 24. Yep. Well. Well, wait, a slash 24, that's the allocation they have. So maybe you don't want to use the whole slash 24 on the 6 or the, on the 6 and 4 tunnel here. No, that's 6 or D, not 6 to 4. That's, that's later. And then, uh, well, actually, that's just what him. Um, you need to know for that the tunnel server address, and they might have a dedicated address range for that. So probably they have a slash 24, but they might have dedicated, say, a slash 32 to 6 or D. Actually, there's a nice story behind, behind this. In the ripe region, uh, a provider can get a slash tw a 32 out of the box if they ask for space, but they just can send an email and ask to enlarge the address space to a slash 29. We won't ask any questions. Why this? 
because there was a provider who made a little mistake in their um, in their addressing plan and they ran out of addresses before they could even think about it. They ran out of uh, um, IPv6 even, even though they had a large address space. So they changed the policy. They didn't change their addressing plan. They changed the policy uh, to allow for a slash 29 to be distributed to end users, to end users, to LARs. But one of the, uh, one of the reasons the, the policy got through was that it could also be used for 6RD in an efficient way. So it permitted other, uh, other providers to come up with a, a meaningful addressing plan for using 6RD. So that you can do the game of using a slash 32 as basic dedicated to 6RD and then get another slash 32 out of the public IP address in v4 that the, your user already has and then you can assign a slash 64 for your users. So how does this work? Well, basically you create a GIF tunnel to the tunnel server if you get the, the address from your provider and you route your IPv6 traffic through the endpoint. It's so simple. It's not nothing, it's not rocket science. Rocket science comes a little bit later with NAT64 and DNS64. But the problem is uh, many providers, uh, we contacted them, they want to have their CPE do it for you because uh, they, they want to have everything under their own control. So they might not allow you to do it on your own. And uh, there is um, there is a provider, I can't remember the name, and I tried looking it up um, recently, that actually uh, provides, your, uh, provides the whole data for you. Uh, so you can, you can, you can do that, uh, but that's a, that's a US-based provider. I don't remember the name. So NAT64. NAT64, instead, you need two components. You need translation and the DNS. Let's take a look at translation in PF. Uh, Peter, correct me if I'm wrong. This is wrong. But there's an AF2 keyword that's built in in PF already. So basically, what you need to do is just provide this line into PF to have uh, NAT64 done at that layer, at that level. So that's already uh, in OpenBSD. So you can just put this line. Actually, I used the slash 96 that's reserved for NAT64, but you could use any of your ranges as long as it's a slash 96. You can use, if you have address space inside your network, you can assign a slash 96 for this purpose and you just put it here. But for now, uh, in my example, I prefer to use the NAT64 dedicated address space. Second way is using Taiga. It's, uh, it's a small daemon, it's like 86 uh, kilobytes of uh, sources. Uh, basically, you just provide five lines of config file, and that's it. I also use the uh, the NAT64 prefix here, and this is available in uh, in the ports. This is just you can just download it and use it out of the box, and uh, it does it in user space using a ton device. So, might be. Uh, might be easier for you to implement this in user space other than uh, differently from, uh, from PF. Now, DNS. DNS 6.4 is actually easier than you could think of because from bind 9.8 uh, uh, up, DNS 6.4 is built in. So basically, just provide um, DNS 6.4 for the, uh, in the options, just provide this keyword. This goes to uh, still slash 96 that we defined earlier and we say the clients for this queries are going to be, I use the documentation prefix, but you can put your own address space in here and have it, uh, and have it resolved for, the, for those clients. When a request comes in that only has uh, IPv4 records, it will translate it into, into v6 embedding the address into this part. And for 464 exlat, this is quite recent. Uh, it was posted on some ripe lists recently. Okay, I didn't put unbound here because 
it's not, uh, well, there isn't still support for that, but if you want, you can ask Bjorn to provide you patches for that. I haven't had time to test CLATD because it was recently announced on the, uh, was announced uh, on Monday on the RIPE lists. Um, we had the RIPE meeting this week and they presented it. So it's CLATD should be, um, it's, uh, it's, it's written in Perl, so it should be easily portable uh, because they wrote it on, uh, on Linux. It's based on Taiga, so it needs Taiga to work together to provide the translation, the final translation. So uh, I will probably follow up with this in, uh, um, in some time. So I will, but you, you just have to know it's there. You can, you can try it. It's on GitHub, so you can take a look at it. And last thing is there's RADVD. So, so, so far we looked at the one, uh, the wide area network part, so from the outside world. But inside your network, you have to enable router advertisements for it to work. So this is a, just enable RADV and RADVD, and basically this is the slash 64 that you want to use in your local network. What this daemon will do is send out router advertisements for your uh, clients to pick up the local network, install uh, an address on their uh, interface and start using v6. Well, just one quick conclusion. The advice we, we, uh, we tell everybody is to just go uh, fully dual stack, but there might be constraints in doing so. So one of the reasons, for example, Swisscom didn't do native v6 to the end users is because they have some these lamps which don't do v6, or maybe you might have some devices in the middle that uh, you don't want to reboot to change the software version because you know that software version is broken on v6 or you have some you need some new uh, new version of the software so there might be constraints so, but uh, there are plenty of choices and it's pretty easy to to set them up as you could see they just require a few lines of uh, configuration to be run so this is one of the, um, of the things that we do at the NCC, is try to uh, get people uh, excited about v6 so much that they go back and start implementing v6, uh, go back to their offices, try to do that as soon as they can. So this was my, my goal for today, to, to try to make sure that you know that there's something out there you can use to implement v6 in your network right out, out of the box, even if your network admin doesn't do his job correctly and only gives you v4. Any questions? No? Yeah. What are your suggestions for uh, like a service provider, not, not an end user, but like... Okay. For, uh, as, as a transitioning mechanism? Oh, well, yeah. Like say we only support um, IPv4 right now. Uh-huh. Do we just add IPv6 or is there the, something... If you're... If your infrastructure could do that out of the box, I would say go dual stack because then you, you avoid any problem about MTU, any problem about DNSSEC being broken or uh, managing, other, um, managing other boxes or adding layers of translation. If you can, just go dual stack. You might have limitations, as I said, um, some box in the middle that doesn't do v4, but if you, if you were to, have to, to need some transition, uh, transitioning mechanism, I would go with uh, 6RD because that's the easiest one, the one you can control, and the one that goes over V4 without much hassle. So I would suggest using that, but as much as we can, we suggest to dual stack from the, from the ground up. Any other question? Well, then, thank you. Thank you very much.